on to the next session. The next session is titled Future Cities. And first of all, I'd like to introduce the moderator, Tom Ravenscroft, is Zine's editor. Um, and the speakers are Suzanne Livingston, Paul Priestman, and Rachel Armstrong. If you'd like to come up and join Tom on the stage. And Tom, I'll, over to you. Thanks. So um, we're going to talk about future cities. And we've got three great panelists here who are all looking at future cities in very different ways. So they're all approaching um, tackling how we're going to live in the future or thinking about how we're going to live in the future, but in very dramatically, uh, well, just coming from very different viewpoints. So first of all, uh, as with the previous talk, we are going to have presentations. So first up, we have Susan Livingston. And if you can just quickly introduce yourself and then go on with your talk. So I had the pleasure of co-curating a large exhibition on artificial intelligence at the Barbican Centre uh, that ran earlier this year and is now on global tour. Um, it uh, was a great thing to be a part of. It taught me a lot about the future in so many ways and the city in particular because it's kind of the richest environment that we, so many will, people will be living in in the future. So um, our exhibition really set out to ask and explore some of the biggest philosophical questions of all. What is human? What is intelligence? What is consciousness? What is machine? What is natural? What is artificial? I co-curated it with my wonderful colleague, Mahola Uchida, who is chief curator at Mirakan in Tokyo. And what was particularly great about working with her was that she brought her Japanese perspective on technology and society. Any exhibition about AI requires consideration of, of the future city because it is the richest, densest, most complex technological ecosystem. And this is Shenzhen, where I spent time in 2014 looking at the future of 3D manufacturing and Shanzai, or copy culture. Our exhibition really set out to look at the components of the, the future sentient city to come. And we started by looking at the desire amongst human beings to bring the inanimate to life. And we can actually trace back that instinct over se several centuries. We also looked at the application of AI across a number of different sectors, media, finance, health, education, and so on. And what becomes clear is that all of these AI systems are now emerging layer upon layer, and they're nudging us, reading us, sensing us, but they're also nudging, reading, and sensing each other. So the interrelationships between these systems are in many different directions. It was important to us that we didn't just look at AI through the human lens, but we actually got inside the machine and thought about how the machine sees us. So we looked at the world of classifiers and facial recognition and the very problematic area of race and gender bias. And we also looked at how AI can read our emotions. This is the work of Affectiva and they have created a piece of technology that can actually process and understand people's reaction in certain situations. And of course, AI can create its own visual landscapes too using generative adversarial networks. And this is the work of Mario Klingerman, who had a very special piece in the show. And of course, that technology is also being used to create deep fakes and wider fake environments. AI is not just about creating uh, virtual realities, it's actually about deep interventions into material reality as well. And as we're hearing about today, when it moves towards the world of synthetic biology, <clears throat> we begin to see new food types, new plant species, new incredible biological materials. And it might be the time, it might be necessary for us to start opening up our idea of the natural because it's been so narrowly defined for so long. We can foresee new animal species. This is the work of Yochi Ochiai and his synthetic butterfly. And we can also foresee entities that look rather like us. And this is Alter 3 the world's most mature robot in being able to read its spatial environments. So what will all of this mean? What will it feel like to be surrounded by a diversity of intelligences and a diversity of species? In my view, we will no longer be center stage. We will no longer be kingpin. And in the West, we find this very difficult. We have a model of the self which is top down, in control, autonomous, rational, and the highest form of evolutionary life. And arguably, this anthropocentric thinking has driven our destructive attitude towards our environment. According to the Eastern belief systems, the Eastern belief systems that we uh, studied through our show, there are some very interesting other ways of looking at the relationship between human technology, which are actually, to me, very futuristic, even though they're based on ancient ideas. Shinto is an animist religion. 
And it has an idea of kami or spirit or interconnecting energy that puts human nature and technology all on the same plane. So humans are one bit part of a much bigger interconnected system. So everything depends on everything else. This is a process of continual, endless evolution. And it, in its best forms, it is always open and exploratory. So I wanted to leave you with this beautiful piece of work by Universal Everything called Machine Learning. And to me, this is the perfect exploration of the future relationship between human technology and context. It's about agility, physical agility, but it suggests other forms of agility too. Mental agility, social agility, political agility, all the tools that we'll need for the future. That's great. Nice, a nice bit of calm in a day of conferencing. So, um, that's very interesting. There, you, you, one of the things you said was that you had uh, a Western and an Eastern curator. You seem to be saying that um, their viewpoints on technology are quite different. Are you saying that we need that people in the West? I imagine most people here are from broadly from the West. We need to learn more from attitudes in the East. Is that well? I, 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 it was definitely the mission of the show to open up this cross-cultural conversation about the relationship between human and technology. And we have a, a, in my view, a quite binary attitude towards technology in the West. And we see it at the moment. There's a strong desire to want to control technology. Um, and by binary, you mean like good, bad? Yes, yes. Is it, is, is it controlling us or are we controlling it? Um, and working with Maholo, those kind of questions don't come into play for her. There's much more an acceptance that, of course, we're all part of this great big system of life together and objects i mean th th this is the reason that japanese culture is seen to be more receptive towards robotics and ai because the shinto belief system is still present it still underpins um daily life and of course as an animist religion objects are seen to have some kind of soul soul isn't quite the right word but some kind of vital energy that we should respect so there's a much more accepting respectful kind of conversational attitude with the non-human world and i think we certainly could be would do well to absorb a bit of that in the west it sounds like a much nicer way of looking at everything i think when you say about objects having uh soul or i think probably rachel's going to talk a bit more about objects not just being inanimate later hey anyway, the next up we've got uh paul and paul do you want to quickly talk a little bit about tell you who you are thank you very much um i'm paul priestman um i'm a chairman of a company called priestman good i'm also uh the global creative director of a company called CRC Sifan in China, which is the largest locomotive manufacturer in the world. And following that fant fantastic presentation, um, I'm going to talk about some, some practical things as well, um, but it, it is a very good overlap at the same time. I was going to start talking about some, some um, infrastructure things and, and, and trains. Um, this is a project that um, we've been working with uh, Hyperloop. We were commissioned to design the exterior and interior of this new form of transport. And the reason this is um, uh, relevant to the discussion today is because uh, railways have always been, um, in effect, in cities, linear developments. Um, if you think about uh, London in its early days and metro land, and the reason that London expanded through metro was because of the metro trains. So infrastructure and trains are, and, and cities are absolutely interlinked. And, and it's not every day that you get asked to design a completely new form of transport, this Hyperloop. And um, I'm sure people know a little bit about this, but basically the, the, the idea is that it's... Uh, it's a vehicle inside a, a semi-vacuum in a tube. So it's, uh, this vehicle can travel at high speed, uh, reduced friction. So it's similar to an aircraft traveling at altitude. Um, and the idea is that you can then travel at very long distances. And the great thing about this, it's, it's away from uh, weather. So every form of transport we have on the planet at the moment, if there's a storm or there's a, some kind of issue, then, then we're interrupted. So it is an interesting form of transport. It's a new form of transport. And, um, 
this, this brings up really interesting um, thoughts for the future uh, about how that form of transport and, and the experience of people traveling in that form of transport. And, and in travel, um, I, I think tr transport and the moving, your travel, is going to become a byproduct of your everyday life. So um, as uh, in certain parts of the world now that uh, your daily or a daily working hour is, is treated from the day you, you leave your, or the moment you leave your, your home to the moment you actually um, get to, back to your home. So the commute is part of your working day. So the process of actually traveling is part of your, your daily routine. And that brings up very big, um, interesting design issues about how you actually uh, live in that space as you're traveling. And these are the sorts of things we're tackling and looking at. This is the first uh, full-size prototype of the vehicle, which was launched a few months ago. It's a very interesting uh, area from our point of view because it isn't an aeroplane, it's not a train, it's something that, uh, that floats. The other interesting thing about uh, public transport is, is that um, in many cities you have massive over-congestion. And as a designer in this area where you're designing a vehicle that's going to last 30 years and it takes 30 years perhaps to, to build a new um, infrastructure line, how do you think to the future? Um, if you go back 30 years, people weren't using mobile phones. Uh, but in 30 years' time, what's going to happen? And the governments and cities have to make decisions about these routes they're building, um, not knowing what's going to happen. So from a design point of view, again, it's, it's how do you tackle that? So we look at modularity, we look at longevity, look at making something relevant for such a long time when, when everything else around it might be redundant. So um, it's very interesting. If you look at the London Underground here in London, which we've designed the vehicles for, we're designing around an infrastructure which is 100 years old. Um, and the brief in that particular project was to try and make it 30% more efficient. And you can do that by design. Um, and it's almost like getting the grit out of the cogs, making things work better, because you can't actually develop things so quickly. So again, we're trying to look at future, how you make things look, work better and solve problems. Uh, this is a, a project which um, we, we were looking at um, the aging demographic, which I think is another thing that we have to think about in cities. Um, and the fact that um, people uh, are having to uh, navigate cities. Uh, if this is causing a problem in public transport, uh, just like the mobile phone. Efficiency in, in people getting on off vehicles is, is real, really critical. And when people are looking at their mobile phones, looking at YouTube and slowing up everybody behind them or jumping up just as the doors are closing, or someone taking time to get on and off trains, is actually delaying the system. It's reducing the efficiency when we need to increase it. So again, looking at design, how can we do that to, to make those things better? And the mobile phone issue, the sort of selfish society we're going through at the moment, people bumping into each other and not moving as crowds, I think is something that technology will move on from. But we're going through this period at the moment, which is a real tackle, a real problem for cities. So this is, a, this is an idea here of a, 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 an object which um, people can use for the whole of their life. Um, it's, a, it's a device that can take them home at the end of the day. Um, it's, uh, it's almost an autonomous vehicle. Um, and I don't believe that uh, we're going to see autonomous vehicles as, as we see them now, autonomous cars driving around the city in any time soon. But I think we will see lots of smaller vehicles, individual vehicles, frequenting the streets. And this is um, just a thought, again, about um, the future. You probably saw a little bit of this video as you, as you were entering the auditorium. And um, this is really thinking about the problem of congestion in cities and pollution in cities. And what, do we, what can we do about that? And um, this was a, a video that we produced a, a year or so ago. And it was really trying to tackle the problem of delivery vans clogging up our streets and the congestion at street level. And how can we solve some of those issues? I just don't think many people understand every time they click and order something on, uh, on uh, the internet, they're actually causing a traffic jam. Uh, or that um, when they're stuck in a traffic jam, there's a little van behind them trying to deliver a, a, a tin of baked beans to someone that needs it right away. Um, so how are we going to solve that problem? So perhaps you can actually deliver at higher altitude. But also it was um, taking all of the information about drones that's going on at the moment and um, trying to sort of embrace it, um, have a more sort of organic feel to it, a more friendly feel, one which is a little bit more sort of uh, embracing, a bit like leaves in the wind, really. So I'll, I'll finish off by saying that um, you know, I, I do think that design has a lot to do with the future of, of, of cities, but also um, in, in, our, in my particular world of how, how we actually practically implement those things, because you need things now. 
and some of those issues are facing us right now. And we're being asked all the time to solve, how can we do something right now and solve those problems? Thank you very much. Cool. It's uh, interesting to see your, one of your things you're working on is making London Underground, or one part of it, I assume, 30% more efficient. So do you think that that's enough? That as, in, uh, as our cities are growing so much, if all of our train lines were 30% more efficient, would, would that, is that enough to make the cities better? Well, I mean, London's a unique situation, but um, no, 30% isn't enough. Um, but I think, there are, it, I think you have to think of it in a joined up way. So it's not just the underground, it's not just the metros, it's the buses, it's the cars. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think we could encourage people to walk more. If you can encourage people to walk longer distances, maybe to a, to a, a bus stop or a metro station, then perhaps you don't have to build as many stations. Uh, the trains don't have to stop as often, and then it becomes more efficient. And, and it, statistically, many people take um, journeys for one or two stops and, uh, in, in, in London. So if you could encourage people not to do that in some way, then, of course, it would free it up for people doing longer journeys. So I think, again, that's, that's sort of more of a technological um, implementation. But uh, encouraging people to walk and keep healthy, I think, is a good thing. Cool. <laughs> I was say, because the city's growing so much, it doesn't seem that, that that's chipping away a little bit of a massive Just problem. try and do everything we can. Okay. <laughs> and Rachel, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and then to over your talk? Hello, I'm Rachel Armstrong and I'm Professor of Experimental Architecture at Newcastle University. And my work looks at the kinds of issues that Suzanne was talking at the beginning, which is how can we make our buildings more lifelike? In other words, confer them with an inner life that possesses some of the properties of living things. So specifically, my work looks at cities from a bottom-up perspective, specifically through the economy of a household, where constituent households don't just consume resources, but actually produce housework that changes our notion of waste. Now, this is possible if we look to the economy of living things, in other words, metabolism. And this is a kind of biochemical network that underpins the actions of every li living thing. Now, metabolism is not an object. It's a fabric, but it's unlike any that we know. It's both inside us and outside of us. It's constantly in motion, incredibly complex, and it's always in a process of flow. In other words, it's too complex for any single person to be designing with. So we need to invoke the help of the masters of metabolism the microbes. Now, by strategically sequencing microbial work through metabolism at the human scale, we can perform housework, which produces a range of products that could be fed back into home systems and are good for the environment. Now, I'm going to share with you how we proved this principle through the Living Architecture Project, which is an EU-funded Future Emerging Technologies Open Award that is uh, enacted by uh, six collaborators. Now, the, they were Newcastle University, University of Trento, University of the West of England, Spanish National Research Council, Explorer Biotech, and Liquid for Systems Group. And so what we did was we generated a microbial infrastructure that can transform waste streams within homes that generate products that can underpin a circular economy of the household. So the way we did this was starting with liquid domestic waste, specifically urine and grey water, which we used as a feedstock. This is then passed into a series of chambers or bioprocessors, where each one of these is an ideal home for microbes. And each one of these chambers enables the liquid waste to be transformed into a range of metabolites and then passed on to the next chamber and so on. They are also programmable, and you can program them by choosing the different species of microbe that exist within the chamber, but also spatially sequencing their reactions. So the system can actually be thought of as a metabolic app. Now, we dealt with two kinds of metabolic app, natural or wild type systems, and also synthetic or modified microbial systems. So I'm just going to talk to you about the uh, first one, the microbial app that's based on uh, wild-type organisms 
designed around a structure called a microbial fuel cell. Now, this is an organic battery that exists as an anode, a cathode, and a semi-permeable membrane. And what the technology does is it captures electrons from a bioelectrically active biofilm to make usable amounts of electricity. And when it does this, this can actually power the cell and it is also regulated by an artificial intelligence which can detect exactly how much electricity is being produced by each brick and then it uh, modifies the inputs accordingly. Now, the power in this system is actually boosted by the presence of oxygen in the cathode. And this is provided by a gravity-fed photobioreactor with a unique geometry and triple baffle system that promotes mixing. And the delivery of the oxygen acts as a terminal electron acceptor. In other words, it pulls the electricity through the battery and makes the system much more powerful. So that's how we configured our natural system. And if we look now at our synthetic system, uh, we designed a synthetic bioprocessor as a way of asking ourselves just how far can we design a metabolism using synthetic biology techniques. So our system could remove nitrous gases, which are pollutants from the air, but our indicator system is shown here, which was inorganic phosphate, which was reclaimed from household detergents. Okay, so in order to get this um, uh, stage, you can see the presence of the inorganic uh, phosphate in that biosensor. Uh, we needed to make a number of breakthroughs. And so the first of these was actually to design a synthetic bioprocessor or brick. Um, this hardware hadn't existed before. Mostly synthetic consortia would exist in the swirly bottle that you just saw earlier. So we actually had to design a home for synthetic consortia to work together. And then we had to figure out how we could work with them at scale. So you can see on the upper level here, there's a farm module, which produces lots of sticky sweet substance for the labor module, which is underneath. And that contains a whole range of workhorse organisms. So these are bacteria that we know the genes of and that we can design those genes to perform specific functions. However, by using different species in a sticky environment, we don't just design with individual species, we can design metabolisms across species and greatly increase the metabolic repertoire. So this is, this is really good news for us because now we can design a whole range of different metabolites that don't exist in nature. Now, during this process, we produced two new um, uh, gene types which have gone for patent processing, but we also produced a new software called Dulix, which is a web-based DNA library design tool, uh, which just makes the whole process of gene sequencing much more intuitive more like Lego. Um, and we were also really conscious about the social acceptability of this system because it contains microbes. And we are in still the age of hygiene where microbes are bad, particularly in homes. Um, so we developed uh, prototypes of the system or living bricks, um, which really helped us think through the final design for the living wall, which was made up of all these different modules of bioprocess or bricks. Um, and this is our first set of prototypes, which were simply hacks of ordinary bricks, vernacular bricks that were turned into microbial fuel cells so they could actually produce power, electrical power. Um, these were exhibited at um, international exhibitions and biennales. And um, this is a second set of prototypes that we were developing, which are rod-based brick systems that combine different metabolic worlds. So here we're combining photosynthetic organisms that like light with anaerobic organisms that don't um, and bringing them into proximity we can get them to exchange metabolites so we use this design then to produce our final uh, bioprocessor species which is a four chamber system divided by different uh, ceramic inserts and can um, remove hundred percent of the inorganic phosphate in the wall system so our metabolic app is not complete without a diagram that shows the spatial sequencing. So waste enters into the top of the apparatus there. It's driven through gravity, through the different stomachs and bricks and different bioprocessor types, uh, deposits all its um, metabolites in the sedimentation tank, and some of that liquid is recirculated throughout the system. So the wall itself looks something like this. Um, but we didn't expose that to the public because of the presence of synthetic organisms. However, we did make a wild type apparatus for the Whitechapel Galleries, is this tomorrow exhibition, as a collaboration with Cecile B. Evans, the artist. 
Um, and you're looking at a work that is a clear walled 13 square meter apartment space, the smallest possible unit for design in London. Um, and it's powered by a microbial fuel cell wall that is connected to a screen-based system. So effectively, we can think of this as a post-human household that is occupied by the ghosts of the past, present, and future. So thinking through these different units, what we can start to imagine is how to transform our waste streams in our cities so they can generate valuable, livable resources. And this means that we now have the infrastructure through which we can reconfigure our homes, our economies, our cities, so that we can actually have a regenerative 21st century society. Wow. <laughs> I feel like we just had a science lesson. <laughs> hope everyone learned a lot and I uh, hope everyone's taking notes. Um, that's really interesting and quite, quite intense. How, how do you see that uh, actually manifesting itself in, in people's homes? I mean, it seems like a very much at a scientific kind of prototype stage or is, how, what's the time scale? Well, well, right now questions? it could take the place of your boiler. Okay. I mean, essentially that's where it goes and then Really, you can see that there are certain components of that that can actually be quite beautifully designed using light and flows of water. So we could either make these very visible within homes or we could hide them away behind um, ceramic surfaces like we do in bathrooms. So essentially, there's a huge scope for design once we actually have infrastructures that metabolize rather than incinerate resource. Um, and so as essentially, these are really just call it sophisticated composting system. This is essentially what soil does, but does it in a spatialized way where we siphon off different fractions like you might do in an oil refinery. I mean, essentially, it's a very, very simple idea, but we're now only just kind of got the uh, visualization techniques that allow us to see microbes at work because they're quite deceptive on the outside because they kind of look like rods or cones or spheres, they kind of look really simple, but inside they're really, really complex, and we can only just see that now. So then that invisible world now is a substrate for design, and this is, a, I guess, a glimpse of the kinds of tools we might use to think about how we might actually design with this. And how does it happen? Like, what's the next step of uh, taking it from, from this and uh, getting people to, well, making it so I can buy it. When can I buy it? What we don't want it to be is a kind of a retro um, agricultural sump. Um, we're developing right now in the ALICE project um, biodigital interfaces, in other words, communication systems that allow you to correspond with your microbes and see how they're feeling so that you can organize your responses to that. So um, uh, essentially, you know, a bit like Bruno Latour's view of the Frankenstein monster, we need to socialize our technologies. And so by developing biodigital interfaces, we start to treat them more like plants or pets um, or gardens. Um, and so we're trying to change the language of what actually constitutes uh, an infrastructure for a livable space. Wow. Uh, very intense. I, I, I feel like I've learned a lot. I've, I've watched most of your TED Talks, I think, as well. And that still looks like, like a very, very succinct um, description. So I'm going to go away and read more. I suppose all you guys will as well. Um, so back, back, back to the, um, the broad topic of our uh, talk was future cities. And I think the question we asked, how will we be living in the future and how will cities be different from now? I feel like we've got a fair idea from Rachel how she feels that. Um, so potentially, uh, Susanna, Paul, in, in 10 years' time, how different, what major way will the cities be different? So Susanna, how will we feel in, in 10 years' time? How will the cities feel compared to today? Phrases that come to mind are self-regulation and self-organisation. So the cities are going to be astonishingly intelligent ecosystems. And the thing I'm most interested in is whilst they reconfigure themselves, they'll also be reconfiguring us. It's very easy for us to look at these design systems and say they're changing in this, that, or the other way, but we will be changed too. We will be physically and <clears throat> mentally changed by these environments. For me, so, so it's going to be a huge transformation um, in terms of our sense of ourselves, in terms of our relationship to the environment, and for me, in, in a positive way, because I, we're not going to feel in control like we have done in times gone by. And we'll need to show some kind of affinity and friendliness 
towards of these, all, all these systems around us that are actually going to be improving things in so many fundamental ways. So for me, it's evolution on both fronts. It's the evolution of the city, the evolution of physical spaces, it, matter coming to life, but we will be evolving too. And we forget that we're an evolving species. We forget that. We think that we're static, but the world out there isn't static and we're not static. So, so the, the, the city, the, well, we will be changing just as much as the technology around yes, us changes. Yeah. I mean, that makes total sense. Everyone I know has got a child now. Their kid is basically fully functioning computer is and using digital technology and growing up in a completely different way than I yeah. did. So, uh, okay. And I suppose, Paul, you've got a slightly different view of that as it, and maybe it's on a more kind of infrastructurally based. So, um, I think um, looking from a positive point of view, I think cities um, will become more enjoyable to live in. Uh, the way you travel around a city, um, I think there'll be more walking, hopefully. Uh, there will be car free, which is happening right now in many cities. So um, I think there will be other forms of transport. I think transport will become, in some respects, uh, almost like creating communities. So as you travel around a city, then those are hubs where you meet people regularly through the way that you communicate with your form of transport. So I think, talking about public transport, um, I think it will play a, a key role in, in, in creating communities in cities. And I think some governments are beginning to understand that and becoming to think about how it can be joined up so that um, all of these new forms of individual transport, scooters, walking, cycling, all of those sorts of things will be part of the infrastructure and will start to take precedence over the dominant four-wheeled large vehicles that we have everywhere. And understanding your ecosystem a bit better and kind of designing for that, which is yeah, in a, kind in of a, what we're saying. But in, a <laughs> in a sensitive way, it's not, it's not just like massive redevelopments. It's, it, as I said earlier, it's, it's like making what we've got work better. Um, you look at old, old photographs of, of cities and there's a sort of few people wandering down a street. And now you look at that same street and all the people are forced to the walls with cars wall to wall, which is just a crazy, crazy situation, which hopefully we'll look back and think, wasn't that a, a crazy a time we lived in? I think, great, Rachel, watching one of your previous talks, you said that we're, we're kind of, everything is based on Victorian infrastructure, I think is pretty much what you said, and we're working within these Victorian systems. So do you think that we can improve our cities based on almost what Paul was saying there about making current systems better and more efficient, or do you think we need to kind of abandon that and do something completely different? Definitely no tabula rasa. I think we'll see more retrofit, and I think it'll be incredibly creative. I think that cities, you know, as we're seeing now, are becoming devolved, let's say, from um, national um, infra you know, uh, centers of power and are actually sites where we could actually see major shifts in power relationships between people and non-human people, um, and, um, which gives us an, uh, a sense that we could actually see a reconfiguring locally of, of politics and economies and a much greater diversity for how we appropriate space, inhabit it, form communities within it, develop systems of exchange within it. So for me, you know, I think the, um, I would like to see the end of you know, putting in over-engineered building infrastructures and then having to knock them down in 20 years time um, and to be able to rework into those spaces rather like Venice has you know, over the millennium. Um, and um, uh, kind of see cities being reworked and reconfigured, but through the city as a center of authority through which I guess we get lots of diverse forms of uh, community exchange and um, you know, power systems. Great. That uh, all makes sense. <laughs> hey, sorry, who got to... I was just going to add in a sort of interesting current example, um, which I'm sure you know about, Paul, which is Kuala Lumpur Airport, where you now don't need a passport or a boarding pass to pass through. So the airport knows so much about you, knows basically you're on your way. So that's a completely different conception of a building to have that much intelligence running through it. Obviously there's troubling sides of that too, but to have a city environment open up and allow you through, I mean, that's just a completely different conception of our environment. Yeah, so it touches on something else I was definitely gonna mention, the, the kind of the negative connotations. I mean, the idea, that idea of walking through an airport and knowing you're there and mm -hmm. letting you on the plane mm -hmm. probably scares people quite a lot. Um, and, and obviously, to me, it seems like over the last couple of years, the broad enthusiasm for mm -hmm. technology is the broad term 
uh, has kind of shifted to a bit more of a, a wariness and negativeness towards all forms of top technology, facial recognition or uh, data tracking or whatever it is. And do you think that's dangerous for the kind of potential improvement of our cities? As in, it's, it's problematic if we don't embrace the technology. Well, I'm, I'm, if pushed, I'm going to be on the positive side, but we have to keep our eye on both sides of this issue all the time. And there's a habit in our culture to either categorize technology and these advanced technologies as good or, as good or bad. And the fact of the matter is they're good and bad at the same time, and we're going to have to learn how to navigate this. Um, in the world of data, we, 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 we have an instinct to be protective, but the world of medical research needs us to give over more data so in some fields, we need much more freedom, free-flowing free, free data. And so we have to, again, make individual decisions about which circumstances we're going to protect and which circumstances we're going to allow. So it's a really a, a time in society where we're going to have to stay incredibly informed. It's hard to take broad-breast decisions at the moment. And I suppose for planning of the cities, it's another area where like the more data we have the better we can plan i mean technology is shifting so fast cities are growing so fast that knowing what's happening is is very important yeah i mean i think i think um hasn't hasn't the horse already gone really i mean the data's already out there um i think uh, the the uh, embracing it I, I do think again on the positive side and not so much on the negative uh, i think this sort of the 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 fact that things can preempt what you want um so that at the moment we go through a lot of processes of of ordering, checking, um, ordering in advance. And, and, and I think potentially a lot of that will happen um, if you're happy to allow it to, to happen before you even think about it. Um, so um, particularly if you're thinking about the, the sort of the care world and, and the aging demographic, then I think there are amazing benefits in that area. Um, and again, it's being built into the infrastructure um, so that, that things can preempt what's about to happen. So on the positive side, yeah, I think it's, it's happening now. It sounds like you guys are all, all quite positive about the future cities. And that's a bit of the next question about um, the future cities. Obviously, I, I think we're saying uh, 2050, there'll be 10 billion people living in the world, most of them probably in cities. And then you've also got the fact that buildings contribute to 40% of carbon emissions. So broadly, let's say, I don't, don't want to broad strokes this in black and white, etc. But broadly, cities are probably a negative to the sustainable future, the sustainable um, our existence, I suppose. So how can cities be a positive impact on the future world? Uh, I, I think there are some serious ethical challenges with the way we go forward from here. Um, um, the world has become suddenly more complex. Um, and that means that um, the binaries that you talked about, Suzanne, are, are just simply not there. There's no good or bad decision. So that we need to stay present with the decision making, whether that's technology or how our cities evolve. And I think that um, we're also in a realm where um, uh, we need to socialize our technologies. We need to stay present with the non-human communities that we depend on. Um, and that different forms of governance, um, different forms of power sharing, different forms of economy absolutely have to come with this. So I think that we, in order for cities to be livable and ethical, I think that we're looking at profound shifts in the kind of work that you're doing, Suzanne, with um, you know the, the philosophical premise on which we can live not just together as, as people, but actually with nature and technology and a whole range of um, other beings, presences, you know, weathers and things, um, you know, and, and how we actually make that into a livable thing. And, and I would say that Haraway, you know, and her staying with the trouble of it all, is um, exactly in the right kind of of, of, of place. That we can't deproblematize this. Um, I think that we just have to stay present, review regularly, um, and uh, be very clear about our ethical positions, even if they necessarily have to change. Anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, full, full, full agreement. Okay, we're going to have got uh, two minutes left at the end now. Does anyone uh, open up for questions of the floor? Does anyone have a question for any of our panelists about future cities, how we're going to be living in 10, 50 100 years' time. Hi. Um, I was kind of wondering, this is a question for all of you, because it all seems that you have PR campaigns to launch for artificial intelligence, for public transport and new forms of communication, and for people living with microbes. How, how can we go about getting people to become comfortable with 
AI in their lives and not seeing it as kind of Amazon listening to our data or Facebook tracking our elections? Um, how do we get people to come around to scooters because there's a lot of people that really hate them? And how are we going to get people to be happy sharing their homes with a boiler that's a lot of kind of things that people would see as bugs or infectious? And so how do we get people to buy into this new, into new technology? Well, I, think. I, mean, I must say, I, I, I don't expect everybody to buy into it. I mean, I think that's the first thing that um, I think essentially, I, you know, what I would like to see are new forms of storytelling about our world and its livability. At the moment, we're in a, uh, an epoch of ecocide, um, something that Bruno Latour has called a profound mutation in our relation to the world. Um, and so that uh, the stories that exist that allow us to, let's say, shed the trappings of the Anthropocene and allow us to move into a new era of exchange do not exist yet. So for me, it's about storytelling. It's about worlding, about creating experiences that can be shared um, and um, essentially, you know, living by example, I think, would be the simplest thing that I could say about that. But we're not going to solve all the problems just simply by making a new technology. I think we absolutely have to change the narrative about our world and start to enact it. And I would add to that that I think we just have problems too big now for humans to solve on our own, on their own. And so we have to look to other forms of intelligence. It's incredible sophisticated advances coming our way and I, I think it's sensible that we be curious about it and we inquire about what it can offer us um, and not put it to our own kind of servant use um, it, it's AI is not the same as us as us so how do we collaborate and how do we unlock what's within it um, and on the question of making friends with the non-human um, you will know much more about this than me but it's my understanding that at a cellular level, we're only 43% human anyway. We're actually a great big mass of microbes <laughs> and all other kinds of viruses and fungi. And, and I would say that molecular biology is giving us the tools to tell completely new stories about who we are. I mean, and they're pretty profound. On, on, that, <laughs> on that note, we'll end. Uh, uh, thanks again to Suzanne, Paul and Rachel. Uh, round of applause for everyone. Thank you.